Playbook for Performance, the official podcast of Shauna Corden, the Joan of Arc for corporate healing and performance. Join the quest to make work fun again by preparing leadership for engaging workplaces. And now, your host. Hi, everybody. Shauna Corden here. Welcome to the Playbook for Performance podcast. Our mission is to make work fun again by building better leaders. So this month, we're talking about a new dialogue, and I'm excited because I'm writing this book about a new dialogue and how our culture has gone from let's agree to disagree to this idea of if you don't think like me, I hate you, we can never be friends. (laughs) In summary, and this week, what I specifically want to talk about is this whole idea about fight stories. You know, what are the fights that people are having? What are they about? How do they engage? How do they escalate? How do we dig in, et cetera? And really, this is not about our inner spirit, the the spirit within us that recognizes we're connected in some way to others, Um, whether your belief is God like mine is whether it's the universe, whether it's this invisible web of atoms that we, you know, move through back and forth, whatever that might be, I appreciate that. And I do think that there's something out there. But for people who think, you know, we're not connected, there's nothing relating to us, we're not common humanity, this podcast probably isn't for you. So I want to talk today about this idea of how the fight begins And what makes us dig into the point where we no longer kind of backpedal, calm down, agree to disagree, or at least pause. And I assert that it's ego-based. And that's why we feel threatened. If it was spirit, it would be like, my spirit trusts your spirit. And there's something bigger here we can learn from. But because when we get into this, because it's so ego-based, it's really not so much even about the issue that we're arguing about. It's the image that we have of ourselves that's being threatened. We are not willing to be vulnerable. We're not willing to even be a step more pleasant than that, which I think is available. We're not even willing to entertain the idea. Uh, Typically, what I meet with my clients who tend to be more questioning and skeptical, more analytical, I could usually convince them to entertain a behavior idea by saying, would you be willing to do an experiment? Just like you did in your science classes, your biology classes, your physics classes, whatever it might be, I want you to create a hypothesis. What is it that we're testing for? What's your hypothesis? And we're just simply going to conduct the experiment to prove it or disprove it. Now, I think it's very interesting. And I, I should add that most of my clients are right on board with that. They're like, yeah, I can try that. I would be willing. But if you're not even willing to experiment, then there's probably a lot at stake. The content of the fight, again, is not about the fight. It's the image and your ego. And the way that I like to think about image and ego is to finish the sentence, I am the kind of person that blank. Now, not too many of us enter an argument where things get heated or things seem severe in the consequences where we say, I'm the kind of person who makes mistakes. (laughs) I am the kind of person who can change my mind. I am the kind of person who apologizes easily. Those things are very difficult for people to sign up for because there is a part of our ego in every argument that is in for the win. Uh, I was, the master's championship was yesterday and I was listening to this little article about Scotty Scheffler who won, congratulations. And one of his roommates, I think it was, had said that, 
you know, this guy doesn't just play to win. This guy plays to win board games, <laughs> you know, whether it's sorry, Stratego, Monopoly, you name it. He's in it to win it. So if you're the kind of person who is out there to win, and I'm not saying that Scotty's a big arguer, but if you're in, the, in it to win, then there's not much room to think about the other values or the other roles that you want to play beyond winner. So when my clients are going through a crisis of any kind, the first question I ask them is, who do you want to be in this situation? So let's imagine your partner has been diagnosed with cancer. Who do you want to be for your partner? It's not like, hey, let's roll up our sleeves, put together the meal plan, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, who do you want to be? Do you want to be the confidant, the cheerleader, the project manager, the primary emotional support? What is it that you really want to be? And let's structure everything around that. So when we are in this argument, we sort of shed away that I really want to be a loving brother, partner, you know, whatever it might be. I want to be this. We get so wrapped up that all of those other identities fall away and we settle on I'm the kind of person that wins. This ego is built. It's accumulated brick by brick, experience by experience. And part of our journey here is we are learning. And we want to be the kind of people who say, I have learned, but there is something that's better than that. There is, I am learning, meaning I'm continuous. I am never ending. I am always learning. There is more for me to learn. There's more I can be. And looking back, one of the best things that has prepared me for this research on this book and the mindset was a coachability study that I conducted with several of my peers. I think it was back in 2005, where we interviewed coaches of all kinds of experience levels, credential levels, and we asked them by um, client level in an organization, are they an individual contributor, supervisor, manager, director, VP, C-suite, etc.? What is the number one factor in being able to coach these people? And the number one factor was, am I willing to question my beliefs? So if you think about the beliefs that you have, if you don't believe that you are the kind of person who can say, I'm the kind of person who makes mistakes. I'm the kind of person who can change my mind. I'm the kind of person who apologizes you are probably much more likely to dig in and dig in hard. One of my least proud moments as a parent was it was in the summer of, I'm going to guess my daughter was four years old. She's riding in the back seat in her car seat. And um, I have forgotten exactly what was going on that prompted this could have been listening to the radio or something. She goes, mom, what does compromise mean? And I was in a pretty pissy mood. Um, It'd been hot. We didn't have air conditioning. I hadn't slept properly for three days. And this is a person, if they awarded PhDs, uh, honorary PhDs for sleep, I'd had 12 of them. I mean, I am a pro sleeper, so I am that much less prepared to um, operate on less sleep. And I hadn't slept well for days. And I said, it's when two people want different things and nobody gets what they want. <laughs> I'm surprised she's not in therapy for that comment. I was not proud, but it, it was the most basic way I could describe compromise. It was This person is starting on this end. This person is starting on this end. And we are each giving a little of what is dear to us in order to have both of us be somewhat happy. So win-win. Even though sometimes it doesn't feel like a win-win, it feels like everybody had to volunteer to lose a little bit. And I think that that idea can come into play here because for all of us who have experienced this gap, the schism in our relationships, 
there's an opportunity to test this, to say, was it because I was married to my ego? I was married to being right. I was unwilling to embrace these identities. Is that true? So this is an invitation. Very soon, we will have the website up in order to have you take the survey, uh, be able to share your story and situation. What was it that happened? And we'd love to follow up with you for some qualitative, in-depth research to test these theories to say, if I had embraced this situation of I am learning, would I still be separated from my friend, my sibling, my parent, my colleague, my child, etc.? And can we coach you through it? That's the intriguing part. My greatest desire for this book is that we are able to articulate the origins of conflict, the mindsets that lead to conflict, the opportunity for avoiding conflict in the future through a conversational model, but also how to repair conflict. Because I will bet lots of money if, as we reflect on these breaks in our relationships, that when you are asked, was it worth it to sever the relationship? The answers are no, regardless of which coordinate I ask. If I ask, what did you gain by severing the relationship? Sometimes people will just say simplicity or peace. But if I say, what did you lose by severing the relationship? They might say something like, this was a dear friend of mine. It was one of my few college friends, childhood friends, etc. My My sibling, the person I shared this common upbringing with, and is it worth it to throw that all away? I have to think no. Unless this was a person that you were always challenged with and it was just exacerbated by the pandemic, chances are there is value in those relationships. The other thing we would ask is, what do you gain by maintaining the relationship? What do you lose by maintaining the relationship? Now, there may be contributing factors here. This isn't causality. It's simply correlation. But thinking about, who was it that said this? This idea that we're only wired to know like 100, 150 people, which uh, that is for sure for me. (laughs) If we're only wired to know that many people, then what is the value of a Facebook where people have thousands of friends. Is it intimate? No. Is it help their need for notoriety, for fame, for uh, you know their version of fame, significance? Is that what that's about? And if that's true, those relationships, those followers, whatever you want to call it, you know, if you came out and you were truly authentic and half that group fell away, it would mean nothing to you. You might be like, oh, I lost a thousand followers, but you wouldn't be hurt like you are hurt with the divide between a sibling, a true friend, a valued colleague, etc. So what happens after the fight is we have this set of feelings that we go through that help us process this. Your feelings about yourself and about them. And most of the people who I have been speaking with about this situation said that they felt terribly about the fight, that it made them feel badly about themselves. It made me, made them tell themselves stories about their colleagues you know, about how they caused it. And the language that I hear is consistent. They forced me. I had no choice. And so we're put back on the back foot in this victim terminology versus that agency, the idea of I am choosing, I am learning. And sometimes people feel that they're in power situations where they're the superior in the relationship, They have less to lose than their colleague in the relationship. And sometimes that feels a little bit like extortion. So I've heard several stories from people who have felt like the 
the conflict was a power situation. And because it was severed, either this person lost their leverage or another person lost their influence, depending on what side you're on. So when we look at this idea of power and we look at the idea of conflict, sometimes people are perceiving this context incorrectly because they're looking at the impact of it through the situation or through the power. But this is when we want to go back and we want to use a tool like Susie Welch's 10-10-10 rule, where we look at the relationship in the context of the next 10 hours and the conflict that's associated with it. What's the impact of the fallout of this relationship 10 hours from now, 10 months from now, 10 years from now? Is it significant? Is it something that you would mourn? And what would it take for you to fall on your sword to repair it? Now, this doesn't mean that you would go back and you would capitulate to those parties to say, I know I dug in and I, I said I was, you know, anti-mask, but, you know, I'm still anti-mask, but I am willing to wear my mask in these situations because you are important to me. Whatever that example might be, is that a possibility or is it still not worth it? Or is the discomfort that's associated with acknowledging and apologizing and the mindset of I am learning just too much? So I would love to hear from you. If you have had a break in a relationship that is significant to you, not a Facebook friend, not a distant associate, not an acquaintance, but someone who is near and dear to you, and because of an issue, you had a break, would you like to participate? Would you like to test the theories? Would you be willing to participate in a qualitative interview? This and follow-up coaching on this. I invite you to contact me. You can reach me at Shauna at Shauna Corden. Dot com. You can also check out the website, www.shawnacordon.com, and you can always uh, send an email that route as well. But we would really love to hear from you. I think this book is super important. Uh, my mission is to mend all these broken fences, to get people back to the relationships that are really quite important to them, and I need your help to do that. So I'm asking for you to participate. And with that, that's all we have for today. Your homework is to think about that relationship, to make a call to me, to say, hey, come fix me, come fix this, (laughs) because we would love to do that. So take care. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to Playbook for Performance. To learn more about Shauna Corden, her consulting programs and tools, please visit her website at shaunacorden.com and follow us on social media at Shauna Corden. Corden.